All right, uh, I'm going to get started since it's uh, 7.30 now. It's commendable that so many of you showed up. <laughs> that was not a fun walk. I hope uh, your commute wasn't as uh, unfriendly to you as mine was. But anyway, uh, so... Yeah, so last class, we kind of closed out the small signal models. And so in particular, we did the first week, we went over DC, then we kind of extended that so we could do small signal not models, and then we learned how to amplify impulse signals. So if you have a kind of a time varying signal, we learned how to design these MOS circuits that can make it basically bigger or amplify it. Uh, and in particular, while we were studying that, we kind of made a, several approximations so one was that we assumed that the input time domain signal was really small. And then what we said was that uh, once the, if you were to increase the signal a lot, you would get this phenomena called uh, distortion, meaning that the input signal would not look like the output signal rescaled anymore. So it would actually have a different temporal variation. And then, uh, so today we're actually gonna kind of look at another pathology that we inherited from our approximation that the capacitors behave as shorts. So in particular, you know, we make all these approximations and we, our goal is for you to learn how to solve these circuits, but we also expose you to kind of the pathological cases so that when you go into a lab and you observe that something goes wrong, then you know exactly 
oh, this is this is a distortion. Oh, this is clipping. And you also know kind of the potential sources of these things. So you know when the uh, signal gets too, the input signal gets too large. That means that there's likely a problem with your assumptions about the circuit, and you can no longer approximate it as linear. So you kind of uh, the, the idea here is that you start kind of getting an intuition of kind of all the pathological cases that we see as engineers because we're constantly making approximations and those aren't necessarily always valid. Okay, so uh, in particular, when we look at this circuit here, this is the, the kind of the full MOS circuit model at the top. Uh, let me make sure I get this pen working before we. Okay, cool. This is the full MOS amplifier circuit model. And then what we said is that at DC, because the impedance of a capacitor is one over J omega C, when I plug in zero for omega, I get an infinite uh, impedance. And so at DC, what will happen is that all of the capacitors will behave at short. Now, as soon as I make this omega non-zero, but it's still small, I have to include my capacitors in the model. And so if we had a low frequency input signal, our actual circuit would look like the uh, small signal model that we discussed uh, yesterday and all of last week, except now we have to consider the capacitors. What we said then is that if you keep increasing omega, so J omega C, if you keep increasing the frequency, eventually this omega becomes so large, so one over infinity approximately, that this starts to behave as uh, zero, because one over infinity is zero basically. And so this is kind of what we've been looking at uh, so far. So we've been assuming that the frequency is high enough or low enough where the capacitors either behave as short or they behave as uh, open. So that's kind of uh, so that's kind of one thing. So the question of this lecture is, at what frequency can we start assuming this? So what is kind of this omega low, what we're going to call omega low, or the frequency at which if we're higher than that, we can start assuming that this mid frequency model is valid. Now, we, we haven't talked about this in next lecture, we're actually gonna talk about this, but there's also a high frequency model. So as it turns out, the uh, MOS circuit itself has some internal capacitances associated with it. These capacitances are extremely, extremely small. They're in the order of between pico and femtofarad. So 10 to the negative 12 to 10 to the negative 15. So they're, they're very small capa internal capacitances of the MOS circuits. And we'll discuss these next lecture. Go ahead. There's no RO. What do you mean there's no RO? Uh, yeah, you shouldn't drop it. So it should be there. It's just that these circuits are from the textbook. And uh, so there's two, I guess there, there is a reason. So to simplify the analysis, that's the main reason. And also because it actually has very little effect on the, uh, on the actual predicted omega low and omega high, but it should be there basically. So there should be a little RO here and there should be a little RO here. It's just that uh, in the textbook to simplify the math, they decided to uh, not include it. But okay, so, but going, uh, keep going along with this, as we keep increasing the frequency, what ends up happening is that at, at the mid frequency, C is so small at the mid frequency that even at this high omega of the mid frequency, we could still be considering these internal capacitance as uh, open circuits. So because the capacitance is 10 to the negative 12 to 10 to the negative 15, there's a wide range of frequencies where uh, you can still consider this mid-frequency model. So to give you an example, let's say this mid-frequency starts at uh, 100 kilohertz, so 10 to the 5, right? 
So 10 to the five times 10 to the negative 12 is one over 10 to the uh, seven, which is actually 10 to the negative seven. So the resistance associated at the at 100 kilohertz for this circuit, uh, for the internal capacitance, it's in the order of 10 to the negative seven ohms. So it's tiny. That being said, you know, uh, a lot of you like to stream content in your uh, houses and uh, you also like to not just watch one TV, but two TVs. Some of you might be on TikTok or something right now. Actually, this semester, all of you are very good. So none of you are, but uh, anyway, uh, having all of these things requires very high uh, frequencies. And so uh, at some point, we're not gonna wanna run this with 10 to the five, we're kind of wanna run this with 10 to the 10. And once you start getting at those high frequencies, then you kind of, uh, have to start considering these effects. And so next lecture, we're actually kind of figure out what exactly is that omega high where we need to actually, uh, where our mid-frequency model breaks down. So in particular, this is the mental picture that we should have. So just, uh, just FYI, uh, this is what's called a frequency response. And uh, we will discuss this in lecture 30. The, we have to make a decision because things don't really fit well in the text. So in the text, as I don't know if you've noticed, but this is actually chapter 36 and 37. Um, we moved it to the front because there is a huge gap in between when you we discuss transistors and when we actually end up discussing this. Uh, but as a result, but the reason that it's those last chapters is because there's also a lot of preliminaries in between. And so we had the choice of basically teaching you this when transistors are fresh in your mind, or basically waiting till the end when transistors are not fresh in your mind and kind of having to reintroduce them. And we found that this actually works better. And so that's why maybe some of the concepts don't make more sense as we kind of go forward in the semester. Okay. Uh, but in particular, the, the mental picture you have is that at DC, there's really no gain because the capacitors behave as open. And so your input is not connected and your output is not connected. Because remember, there's a capacitor between the input and the output. So you get nothing out. So that's why this is at negative infinity. This is in the, in the log scale. Then you keep increasing the frequency and you start getting some gain, some gain, some gain, some gain. And then you reach this omega low. And this is the omega low that we're going to predict, we're going to actually discuss today. Once you know this omega low, then at the mid frequency range, this is the gain that you're actually predicting when you are analyzing these circuits. So this is AV and AVI. And uh, so for a wide range of frequencies between omega low and omega high, we can actually uh, we can actually consider the gain as nearly constant, but eventually we hit omega high. And again, now the internal capacitances start becoming important. And uh, the transistor, those internal capacitors will eventually start behaving as short again if you keep increasing the frequency. And so now you have like the drain and the source shorted, the, the gate and the source shorted. And as a result, you can't really get any gain uh, up to after some frequency. So there's actually a lot of work in this, uh, trying to increase the frequency, like I said, because we want more bandwidth. We want... Uh, the, the, the higher the frequency we can go, the more data we can put through our communication systems. And the more data we can put through, the more things you can stream simultaneously, the higher the quality of video and so on. Go ahead. So I'm kind of confused. When we mid frequency and high frequency are those axes? Because when we like hit mid frequency, are we like assuming that we're not going to be able to do that? that really good? So that's what I'm trying to say. It's, a, it's, it's relative to these capacitors. Omega is really big, but relative to the internal capacitors is really small. So these capacitors, you typically will make them are in the order of one microfarad. So these capacitors might be 10 to the negative six. Um, and uh, later we're, we're going to actually look at what the actual cutoff frequencies is. And what you're going to get is that these cutoff frequencies are in the order of 10 kilohertz. But so since this is 10 to the negative six, this thing starts to behave as short. So for example, even for our little uh, 10 to the five frequency, one over 10 to the five 
times 10 to the negative six is equal to 10 to the one, or sorry, uh, point 0.1 uh, resistance. So at 10, 100 kilohertz, the resistance is point 0.1 associated with this capacitor. But remember for the internal capacitor is 10 to the negative seven. So it's orders of magnitude smaller. Uh, and so there's a wide rate of frequencies where we can start considering these things as short while still maintaining these as open. All right, so now we're now, now that I kind of like teased you and told you what we're gonna actually teach you. Uh, so here's actually the answers to all of our things. So we're gonna define these tiles and I'm gonna teach you how to derive these tiles. And in particular, uh, for each individual capacitor, we're gonna have a tau associated with it, which actually represents the uh, one over the frequency where our assumption fails for that particular capacitance. And then we're gonna say that our cutoff occurs at the, at the highest frequency where one capacitor fails. So basically one over tau one is the frequency where cap capacitor one stops behaving as a short, one over tau two is the capacitance where the frequency at which capacitor two stops behaving as a short, and one over tau three is really the frequency where capacitor three stops behaving as a short. And so what we're gonna say is that as soon as one of those fails, that's that's our omega cutoff. And so that's why we choose the maximum of these three frequencies. And we're gonna do this for each particular uh, circuit. So I should have written this formula here, but I didn't. Uh, to figure out what the omega low is. Something that's interesting is that, it as it turns out, the way we design these circuits and when we build them, it will always turn out that the capacitor that will most likely end up uh, resulting in your omega low is the capacitor that's connected to the source terminal. So in the case of the common source, it's just going to be C3. In the case of common drain, usually C2 is the limiting capacitor. And in the case of the common gate, usually C1 is the limiting capacitor. So these are the results we're actually working towards. Um, and uh, now I'm gonna tell you how we get these results. So, okay, so how do we get these results? So what we're gonna actually do is uh, start with our, start with our uh, low frequency model. And then we're gonna assume that one of the capacitance is, is not uh, following our assumptions. So let's assume that C1 is not following our assumptions. So that means that C2 behaves as short and C3 behaves as short. And now C1 is no longer behaving as short. And then what we're gonna do is find the Thevenin resistance looking into uh, that particular capacitor. So we're basically gonna remove the capacitance from that uh, circuit. Put, do a VXIX ter, uh, test, or if you can do it by inspection, you can do it by inspection. Once we find that Thevenin resistance, what we're gonna do is just uh, multiply the capacitance times this Thevenin resistance to get what we call the time constant associated with that particular capacitor. And then uh, we're gonna do this for all capacitors. And then once we do it for all capacitors, we just pick the maximum, one over the maximum. And that's kind of our, uh, our heuristic for doing this. I, I will explain to you why we use this parameter in the next few slides, but first I'm just gonna go over the mechanics of how you actually compute these things. Go ahead. Are we finding the seven in position that is just are responsible? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you do that for each three, like after you find that one, you do it for the other two. Yeah. So you're gonna figure out tau one. First you find R7 and one, you multiply by C1 and that gives you tau one. Then you find R7 and two. So basically then you basically go for this one. So then you short these two, you find this R7 and three, and then you do it for the other capacitor. So you short these two. And then, but what you're really saying is, let's assume that this capacitor failed. Uh, uh, what, uh, what is the equivalent resistance seen by that capacitor? And then you're saying kind of like, let's assume that the other capacitor failed and so on and so on. So just to give you an example, I'm gonna very quickly go over this. So this is kind of our mid-frequency model. And so let's say we wanna find R7 and for this particular uh, C1 here. So what we're gonna actually do is uh, do a VX IX test. So I'm just gonna connect that voltage source here. 
minus plus. So this actually is behaving as an open. Well, not as an open. I'm just looking at the resistance looking into this two terminals. So this is Vx. Uh, this slide is not good, but okay. And so here you see how it's shorted. Please make uh, here. I got it. I know what I'm going to do. Yeah, so I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna find the Thevenin resistance across these two terminals. So now you see that there's a gap there. So this capacitor, I'm looking into the two terminals and now I just remove the capacitor. So what I actually need to do is first, I need to short all external sources. And in this case, there's only one. And then I have to basically figure out Ix here. And my Thevenin, uh, my Thevenin resistance is just Vx over Ix. Now, note that you only have to do this Vx Is test for whenever there's a dependent source. I'm being a little facetious, and I'm doing it for all of them just so that the method will always be the systematically the same. But if you know how to do it a different way, all I'm doing is finding the Thevenin resistance. You do your thing. OK, so in this particular case, I can just basically look at this uh, loop equation. So what I'm going to get is that, uh, uh, da, da, da. so first of all, Ix flows through here. Ix flows through here. So that means that uh, negative Rs Ix, which is the voltage from here to here, plus Vx, which is the voltage from here to here, minus Ix R1 in parallel to R2 have to be equal to zero. So I just did KVL around this loop here. Is this KVL equation kind of clear? Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. So now all we have to do is solve for the ratio of Ix and Vx, and I did this in the next slide. So in particular, this is the equation that I hand wrote. And then all I did was just simply move Vx to the other side. And then that gives me Vx over Ix is actually just equal to these two in series. So I found the Thevenin and resistance, that's it. So tau one for this particular circuit is equal to C1 RTH1 uh, times RTH1, uh, which we just, uh, Found. So we just found tau one. Now we got to repeat this for the second capacitance. And so for the second capacitance, now I uh, the other two capacitors are shorted, and now this one behaves as an open. So now we need to look at the feminine resistance looking into that terminal. So I basically do a Vx Ix test. So here is the Vx, and again I just do a KVL loop. So we know that Ix has to flow through here because, uh, da, da, da. okay, so in this particular case, C is shorted and this is grounded, which means that this, the source is grounded. Additionally, uh, no current can flow through here because this is open circuited, which means that since no current flows through here, well, actually this is shorted, uh, since no current flows through here, the gate is also grounded which tells you that VGS is zero. And so now you can basically plug in zero for this. So now you know that no current flows through here. And so now you can just basically do the KVL loop here, assuming that IX flows through RD and IX also flows through RL. And so that's what I wrote here. So negative RD IX is just really the voltage from this node to this node. Negative RL IX is just the voltage from this node to this node. And Vx2 is just the voltage from this node to this node. And so that's my KVL loop. They should all add up to zero. I do a little bit of algebra and boom, you get C2. So I'm not going over the analysis of these circuits in a lot of detail. You are kind of responsible for that. At this point, you know, you 2K1, you should be somewhat, uh, and if you're not, I mean, you should work on that. Uh, there's infinite ways to solve these circuits and get the same answer. I just gave you one of them. <laughs> but all we're doing is finding R Thevenin looking into here. That's it. There's nothing else. I'm not doing anything magical, nothing else. 
Okay, so now we do go for the third terminal. And uh, this one's a little bit more involved, but you can basically analyze this circuit to get what Ix is over Vx, and then you get your orthevenin. And once you get your orthevenin, then now you have tau three. So at this point, is it clear to everyone how you find these taus? You have a question? Yeah. You question? Just say it. <laughs> Oh, okay. So in this particular circuit, this is a little bit more complicated, but basically you have that uh, here because this is open, right? No current will flow through here and no current will flow through here uh, because basically you have this in series with an open circuit, so no current can flow. And so that means that whatever voltage is down here has to be up here. So that tells you that VG, which is this terminal, is actually zero. And once you know that VG is zero, well, in this case, since this is zero and this is VX, and this is the source terminal, that means that VS has to be equal to VX. And so zero minus VX is negative VX or VGS equals negative VX. Of course, you could have just derived a bunch of loop equations and then done simultaneous and you would have gotten the same thing. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to do this, but does that make sense? Okay, any other questions? Procedurally, are you understanding kind of the uh, the high level? Uh, go ahead. Sorry, how did you get the right side of the equation on the third one? Yeah, so one thing is here, uh, so we need Vx over Ix, so that gives us that one over RSS. Sorry, I'm not sure. Line above it. Okay, the line above it. On the right side of the line. Um, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so this is a, there should be a purple dot here, but that's actually the nodal equation on the purple dot. But uh, yeah. Speaking of, this is this is why you shouldn't encourage questions because then you don't know how to answer. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> no, okay, so you see here's the I X. Okay, so let's start with, so we're doing this nodal equation here. So we're gonna assume all currents are flowing out. So there's a current flowing this direction, which is Vx over RSS. So that's this term here, is that cool? Then uh, this there's a current coming into here, which is the current coming out of the source. And so that current is actually coming into the node. So that's why we do negative Ix. And then here we have GM VGS coming into the node. And so that's why we also have, sorry, GM VGS coming into the node. So that's why it's negative GM VGS. And so that's basically uh, what this, this equation is. And then going from the left equation to the right equation, all I really did was just replace this VGS uh, by negative Vx. And so that made it into a positive sign. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's how I went from that. And then here, once I had it here, really this is, uh, I can move this to the other side. So then I get that Vx equals one over RSS plus gm to the negative one, ix. But this is really just uh, RSS, the equivalent resistance of RSS in parallel to one over gm. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's how you're gonna heuristically do this. Uh, it's a clear kind of the process of getting all these tiles. Once you have all these tiles, all you got to do now is just basically pick the biggest one. So we just derived these three formulas for the common. Uh, can anyone tell me what kind of amplifier this is? Yeah, common source, because when this behaves as a short, the source is grounded. Yeah. Um, cool. So you just pick the you just pick the largest omega low. Now you're good. Now you know when. Uh, this particular mid-frequency assumption will fail at the low end. That's that's all you're gonna do. 
Yeah, so that's uh, typically for this particular circuit, it's always going to be one over tau three. And that's in particular because uh, one over GM is going to be much smaller than all the other resistances. And so this parallel configuration will approximately behave as one over GM. And uh, yeah, so that's going to give you the lowest uh, seven. That's going to end up being kind of the limiting factor for this particular amplifier. That's not so important. What's important is that you know how to come up with these omega Ls at this point. Okay, so I just basically kind of bullied you into figure into uh, and told you that, yeah, this is omega low and you need to find this tau parameter, but kind of what's the significance of this tau parameter? Okay, so we're gonna have a much more full understanding of the meaning of this tau parameter that next week, but the week after the next, because that's when we're gonna start actually looking at these kinds of circuits. But just as a preview, and so that you get a kind of a feel for why we're so keen on this tau parameter, I'm going to kind of give you a, a brief overview of why. Okay, so in particular, we have this RC circuit. The the if we do a KVL, well, first of all, if this circuit has been kind of disconnected for a very long time, this capacitor will behave as an open circuit, and so as a result. Uh, the one terminal would be a ground and the other terminal would be a ground and the voltage across the capacitor will be equal to zero. In contrast, if, a, if at some time T1, we uh, turn it on, so we basically flip the switch so that we connect the circuit. Initially, some currents kind of start to flow through the circuit, through the circuit, and eventually, uh, there's going to be some energy stored in this uh, capacitor and the voltage drop across the capacitor will actually be equal to five volts because the capacitor will start be to behave as a wait, open circuit. So after a very long time, so VC, so here, VCs of infinity will be equal to five volts. So in two weeks from now, we're actually kind of learn how to basically analyze these circuits and actually develop their temporal behavior. So are there questions at this point? Uh, yeah, just. Uh, so what's going to happen is that, uh, so the, the IV relationship for a capacitor is C, D, D, T of V. And so if you leave this on for a very long time, the, once you solve the differential equation, what you're going to observe is that uh, eventually this capacitor will charge up and then the whole voltage drop will be yes across the capacitor. This is the same as saying that if you're at DC, the capacitor starts to behave as open. It's just a different way of saying that. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and remember, once we flip the switch, if we leave it on for infinite time, that's basically a DC signal. But uh, yeah, I, I understand why this that that particular point is not clear, and it's because we haven't really gone over the differential equation parts, which will be in two weeks. But the point is, is that after a very long time, this thing is at five volts, and at this point, you're going to have to believe me that when we look at VCs as a function of time, what's going to end up happening is that uh, this VC will always have a a behavior something like this, where before T one the voltage uh, across the capacitor is gonna be zero. And then it's gonna basically exponentially, exponentially approach this uh, five volts across the capacitor until we get to kind of that DC steady state or value. And in particular, the rate at which this happens is depending on this tau factor. And it just so happens that for this RC circuit, the tau factor is equal to RC. And so really what the significance of that tau factor, what it's really predicting is kind of the, the, the time constant looking into that capacitor or how long does that capacitor take to respond to a signal? So it's a measure of that. And so that's why we're that's why we're always looking for this R7, because we're really trying to 
that R7 and times the capacitance characterizes the response and how long it will take to actually reach that infinite value. And in turn, because uh, because it tells us something about how long the circuit takes to respond, it also tells us something about uh, the frequency at the lowest frequency that this thing can actually uh, behave as a short. So that's kind of the intuition behind these tiles. Uh, yeah, and so the solution for the circuit will always be kind of after one tau, you're going to be at a certain place. After five tau, you're typically already at the max. Okay, so we define the cutoff frequency as one over tau, in particular because if the solution is at a short enough amount of time, so if, if you have your input signal, and the input signal is on for a very short time, that corresponds to a high frequency. And if it's on for a very short time, we observe that the voltage change in the capacitor is actually quite small, or the voltage drop across the capacitor is quite small after that very short time. And so that means that we can approximately treat this capacitor as short. Now, if the frequency is low, which corresponds to having the signal on for a long time, the voltage drop across the capacitor is high. And so now we say, oh, well, it behaves like an open. And so that's kind of that, that's that's kind of what we're really doing. We're trying to to we're finding these seven and resistances. We're actually just trying to find the time constant of that particular terminal. And then from that time constant, we can infer what when it's high, when it's low. Okay, so that's that's basically what we're doing. And so just uh so just to kind of summarize uh, our discussion, tau is really a measure of how far fast a first order circuit responds to a signal. And uh, to approximate capacitors as open, we require that omega is less than one over tau. And to approximate them as short, we require that omega is, uh, wait, uh, less than uh, one over tau. Wait, uh, my is this correct? Whoa, 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 God. This should be short. This should be open. Does anyone know why this is wrong? What, when do we treat capacitors as a uh, short? Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, if omega is small, you be it's open, and if omega is large, it should be short. But the the transition between what we mean by small and large is uh, mediated by this tau. And my inequalities were wrong, or yeah, it should be this. Is that uh, so? At this point, are there any questions in particular? Go ahead. So there's going to be some variation in the behavior as we get closer and closer to one of the tau. Do we ever have to account for that? Not in this class, but yeah, <laughs> if you're designing a circuit, yeah. <laughs> but uh, at this point, we're just kind of uh, the goal with this tau is for you to get an idea of where you should expect problems. Um, go ahead. So you're saying. As omega gets smaller, it's like it becomes unopen. Yes, yes. As omega gets smaller, it becomes unopen, and you start kind of using this DC model. And in particular, it's because, okay, so if you think of a frequency, right, you have a sign. So you can think of this, of, uh, this, uh, this is the time that the distance between here and here, this is the time the signal is on or on the positive part. And so what will happen is that uh, as you increase frequency, what happens is that this sign becomes, the time between the up and down becomes narrower and narrower, okay? Is that cool? As you increase frequency, so this is omega is small and this is omega large, okay? Well, when you think of that as you can think of this as, turning the switch on 
And if omega is small, that corresponds to keeping this switch on for a very long time. Meaning that by the time, by, by the time that you actually get to this negative phase, the, the voltage across the capacitor is actually quite large. So because the voltage across the capacitor is quite large, that means that this capacitor is behaving as a open or closer to open, because remember, this is in series to this uh, resistor. And so that means that this uh, particular circuit is drawing out less current because the voltage drop is I times R and there's less voltage across the resistor because there's more voltage across the capacitor. And so, yeah, basically it's voltage division, but uh, may maybe I should have drawn a VR next to it because I think that could have helped. Okay, go ahead. Are you saying like capacitor now acts as like a really big resistor? Yeah, it acts as a big resistor. That's another way of saying that it acts like an open. Yes, yes, exactly. That's that's exactly what I'm trying to say. Because this capacitor behaves really as one over J omega C. Uh, and phenomenologically, what, when we say this omega becomes big, the capacitance, phenomenologically, what we're really saying is that all of the drop will, that this signal is on long enough that we actually get all of the drop across the capacitor. And so the capacitor behaves as an open. Uh, that's phenomenologically what we're really saying when we were doing all this phase or not, or when you were doing this phase analysis in 2K1. But if the signal is not on for long, so there's kind of the other side, right? That means that if we're here and here, that means that after the whole cycle, you see the voltage across the capacitor is quite small. And so we just say it's zero. <laughs> and so that's why we say the capacitor behaves as a short. So the, the, there are approximations, but this, this is really our mental picture. Uh, and what's, what's important is that these circuits uh, their behavior does not change with uh, their behavior is exactly identical. The only thing that changes is the x-axis. And if you write this x-axis in terms of tau or one or or one over RC or sorry of R or RC, you actually always get the same uh, act, the same plot over and over again. Okay. So is that more or less clear to everyone? Yeah. Cool. I mean, so now we're basically done. That so that the <laughs> so how we're gonna find this omega lows is just basically we're gonna find the tau for each capacitor. That's what we did in the first example, and uh, we actually have time for the second example. And there's a third example in the slide, so we'll just brief, very rapidly go over it. So we start with this circuit. So we can draw the small signal equivalent model. So let's just uh, draw that. So what kind of what kind of uh, amplifier is this? Common gate. Yes, exactly. So the uh, when we look at our our uh, mid frequency model, the gate is shorted, and so this is a common gate. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put the gate at the bottom the source here and the drain here. And then there is always a current source connected to the source between the source and the drain. This is the source, this is the drain. Remember that the current source always points towards the source. So that's kind of the, the big thing. When you're doing small signal model, no. All, all transistors are created equal in the small signal model. And uh, in particular, what we did in our derivation is that at the very last step, we took the absolute value of VGS minus V threshold. Um, and by taking that absolute value in the PMOS case, when you actually write out the proof, which we wrote in the previous slides, what ends up happening is that, that, uh, that you end up basically putting a negative sign in front of that, but that negative sign effectively switches the polarity in the circuit symbol. And so it takes, so basically that means that we can use the same model for both P and N MOS, essentially. Yeah, so all, 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 all uh, MOSFETs behave, because at that point you're, so the, all of the DC information and all of the MOS 
Moss information is actually embedded in that I drain. And once you compute that GM using that I drain, you're already incorporating all of the things about the transistor into your small signal. So at this point, you're not really dealing with that transistor, you're dealing with the equivalent circuit model. So that so we at the DC, you need to consider the differences. You need to actually like take make sure that V threshold is the correct sign. You need to make sure that you're in the correct, you're using the correct inequalities to find the region of operation and so on and so on. But once you find that ID, that's it. You 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 need you can't you can forget about the transistor. Now you're you're dealing with the small signal model, which will always be, look at the same, independent of what that original transistor was. Okay, so yeah, so okay, so now we're gonna let's let's just go through this uh, thing. So we're gonna draw actually the low frequency model. So in particular, there will be a capacitor here, a capacitor C two between the gate and the ground, and then this terminal here, R one and R two, what are they connected to when we're looking at the small signal model? Like what are the two terminals? Yeah, how about some from the back or is it clear that it's the gate and ground? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay. Oh God, R2, cool. So yeah, so this thing is connected here at the gate and it's also connected to ground because we always ground our voltage sources or DC voltage sources. So here's one, here's two, they're in parallel. So there they are. So now we're done with the gate. So now we gotta go to the drain. And so what is the RD connected to? Huh? Yeah, ground and drain. So basically you just go flip, 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 RD. So this is the ground and this is the drain. And then what is the, this, branch terminal connected to yeah so it's connected to the drain and then it's connected to a capacitor and then a resistor so rl and then c3 nice so at this point there's no more terminal so now we're left with these two and can anyone tell me how they're connected? So I guess from that side, because I've been getting a lot from this side there. Huh? No? Oh, so if you look at the source, what is kind of RSS connected to? Source and ground. Yeah, source and ground. So exactly. So the source, RSS, and ground. And then what is C1 and RS? and VS connected to. Yeah, so now you have to basically have C1, RS, and uh, VS. So this is our small signal model. And in this class, we're never actually gonna solve this circuit, but we need it so that we can compute those time constants. I'll go ahead. What do you mean RL? Oh, RL is here. Is that what you mean? Where's RL? Oh, but RO is a RO is a parameter that we kind of make up. It's an equivalent resistance looking oh, okay. out of the terminal. No, no, no. I guess uh, maybe we can talk about that offline. But basically, it's more that our capital RO is an equivalent circuit that we derive out of all these resistances. So RO is really. R, in this case, it's RL in parallel with RD, if I'm not mistaken. That's what we call capital RO to make it look nicer. But go ahead. What do we know when they have RL on and not have? Uh, it's like for the homework, you have to have RL. So I'm just gonna say this. This is a this is a agreements you should send to Arthur Turlip and uh, Tavash. So the answer is you should never include RL. Uh, but I I think that they. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, and I think they told you it's infinite so that it's not included automatically. Okay. But uh, the the whole point is that when you're designing these circuits, you don't know what RL is because RL is kind of what the user connects to the thing. So RL is the speaker you connect to your guitar amplifier. That's the load. And you have no idea what speaker is going to be connected to this guitar amplifier. And so you have no idea what RL is. And so you typically derive a equivalent circuit model of the form of RIS plus minus VI uh, AVI VI and then R capital RO for all of these uh, for all of these circuits. So you typically derive this model. And the idea is that then someone comes in and they connect an RL through the circuit, but then you just give them these, the, the VI, you give them the AVI, you give them the RO and you give them the IRS. And then they're able to uh, compute what the, what the gain will be across their load. And so these parameters are actually designed so that you can hand off your amplifier to someone and then Based on the load they connect, they can actually figure out what the actual gain they'll observe across that load. And so it, it just makes no sense to include that load into the, in the, to the computation of these parameters because you don't know what the load is. Uh, but uh, somehow in, in, in the book, they actually say this in the, in the whole description. They just, I think, made a mistake. Uh, so you never include RL, RL when you're computing these output resistances. Okay, so now that you have this like little drawing, what you're gonna do is basically do what we just did. So remember, this was our mid-frequency model. So you're just basically gonna first uh, take one capacitor, do a VXIX term, find R7 and one. Then you're gonna take the second capacitor, do IX VX test, get R7 and two. Then take the third capacitor, do a VXIX test, get R7 and three. And then you just simply pick the maximum one of the three. And then you're done. So you're just always going to be doing this process. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, it. And actually, we are out of time. Are there questions? Everyone. Okay.